Last week we began to move, uh, talk about uh, the DTR talk, uh, defining the relationship, a, a talk that uh, every couple goes through at some time uh, in, their, in their life. Uh, it's a talk that we've got to begin to look at in ourselves, in, the, in, the, in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I had a couple extra things to really talk about, especially when we begin to talk about defining the relationship with, uh, with where we are with Christ, where we are uh, with the Word. We've got to remember a couple of things as we left off last week that Jesus has a lot of fans today. There's a lot of fans out there, but followers are getting fewer and fewer. Uh, as, as we begin to look across the spectrum and as, as people are beginning to uh, look at things like this, they're beginning to understand that really what they were as a fan, they really weren't a follower, and people are beginning to dive in and find out what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. The fact is Jesus has a lot of fans today, but the fact is that when you begin to look at the Bible, folks, Jesus was never interested in having fans. That was never his calling. He never said, come be a fan of me. Uh, come be an admirer of me. That's not what Jesus ever told anybody. He always said, come and follow me. Uh, Christ has always been looking for followers of his teaching, which we know of now as the Bible, uh, which, which is one of the rulers that truly we use. How do we do go through an accurate measurement? Uh, the, how do we begin to look at ourselves? How do we begin to assess, are we a fan or are we a follower? Uh, the problem with asking this question uh, is, is this, when you begin to ask it to yourself, it's almost, po it's almost impossible sometimes to be objective. It's almost impossible to look at yourself with the confession that, man, I mean, is it possible that I might be a fan and I might not be a follower of Christ? It's, it's, it's very hard sometimes for us to look at ourselves and become objective in our faith and our objective of what we are, what we are truly, where our standing is with Jesus Christ. If you say that you're a follower, let me ask this question here. What makes you so sure? Why, why do you say, if you say, well, I'm not a fan, I'm a follower, what, what truly makes you so sure? Uh, what's the measurement you use, you're using to define your relationship with Christ? A lot of people make the mistake today of using cultural comparisons. Well, I'm this and somebody else is this, or they'll use cultural in the, in the sense of the church. Well, the church says to do this. This is our 16 fundamentals of faith, or this is our 8, 9, 10, 20 fundamentals of faith. Well, I'm doing all of those, and therefore, obviously, I'm a follower. I'm not, I'm not just a fan of Jesus. I'm obviously a follower. They use what we call cultural uh, comparisons. They begin to look at other people around them. They begin to look at, they, they compare themselves to other Christians. Well, I am, I'm truly uh, a, a far better Christian than so-and-so. Well, that's a real bad comparison uh, when you begin to look at it. Because what happens is a lot of people compare themselves to other Christians who are almost anemic. They're, they're, they, 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 they don't look many times for the, those who are really stout in the faith. They don't look for the people who are, uh, if, if you will, the Moseses and the Peters. No, they don't look for those. But many times they look for the people who are almost anemic in their faith. Because that way, well, I think I was telling you last week about the curve. People grade themselves on a curve. So as them people fall, that curve gets lower. See, I don't have to raise my standards if somebody else is following falling if I'm using them as the standard for me to measure myself by. In fact, I can lower my standards. And that, my friends, is what's going on today. In Christianity, we are lowering our standards. And the standard has never changed. The standard has not changed for 2,000 years. I would say I'd go all the way back to Moses and them because Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill the law. Much of the law is still with us today. Uh, many of the things that were taught in the Old Testament truly are here, are here today. Yeah, thank God for His grace. But let me tell you something, folks. The standard of God has never changed. Otherwise, in Malachi, He wouldn't have written, I am the Lord thy God, and I change not. God has never changed. From Genesis, making of Adam and Eve, to today in 2012, God has never changed. His standards have never changed. So if we are lowering our standards, we've got to begin to look at the standard and say, wait a minute, maybe we need to raise the bar. Now when you begin to raise the bar when you're measuring yourself according to the standards of God, 
Now how do you look? Now comes the real question, how do you really look by his standard? And this is where we've got to begin to, to measure ourselves and how, and how we're going to look at ourselves. Um, <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, that's why a lot of folks are sometimes, um, I might say, judgmental and almost to a point where they're glad when somebody uh, who they picture to be at the top might fall because they now feel better about themselves. You see, folks, that, that's how this curve works. And it's not good. It's not good. We've got to begin to keep that bar very, very high. Uh, another measurement that people use are religious leaders. Uh, as, as I just said, when, when they begin to fall, we begin to fall right along with them. How many religious leaders have fallen in the past? People who others may look at high esteem. A lot of these folks have got TV shows. I'm just going to say it the way it is. A lot of these folks got really, really, really big, big ministries. And when they fall, all these followers fall with them. How is that possible if they're a follower of Jesus? In fact, they were a follower of that guy. That's what happened. They weren't a follower of Jesus. They were a fan, but they were a follower of this teacher. We don't use people, folks, as a measurement. Not in any way, shape, or form. We never use people as a measuring stick because they're going to fall. There's going to be a time when you may see somebody do something in their life that you, that you may be shocked by. You shouldn't fall at that time because they're not your standard. They're not who you're measuring your life by or, or, or your Christianity. <clears throat> we take a lot of other ways to determine if we are followers. Uh, we take denominational measurements. We take family heritage. Many people take biblical knowledge. I know the Bible, and therefore I'm a follower. Are you? We're going to talk about that in just a second. I'm going a little deeper with that. Because you know the Bible does not make you a follower of Jesus, of, Jesus, of Jesus Christ. We've got to begin to look at how we are plugging the things into. Um, I, I want to read something for you real, real quick. Um, with, our, with four kids at home, we are constantly on medical websites trying to diagnose whatever ailment is being passed around. One of my favorite websites has a search function that allows you to enter in whatever symptoms you suffer from, and then it gives the most likely diagnosis. For example, you type in runny nose and nausea, uh, the website informs you that it's likely you have the flu or a food allergy. But if you add lightheadedness, then it narrows it down to a food allergy. If you take away lightheadedness and add fever, then the diagnosis is more like the H1N1 flu. The more specific your symptoms, the more likely you are to get a correct diagnosis. You understand that? The more specific, the more you go to your Bible and you begin to plug in what Christ has called you to do, the more accurate your diagnosis of whether you're a fan or whether you're a follower is going to be. But what we've done today is we've removed the symptoms. We've taken the symptoms out, and therefore we've lost the concept of a fan or a follower completely. We just simply don't really know the real difference between the two. And therefore, as I saw shared with you last week, our churches have turned into stadiums and we've lost the, the, the sanctuary, which is what it is supposed to be. But they've turned into stadiums with people cheering all over the place. Are you a fan or are you a follower? John chapter 3. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, I want to talk. I told you last week we're going to begin to talk about a couple of... Uh, specifics, a couple stories in the Bible. We're going to start this week with the story of Nicodemus. John chapter 3, a very familiar chapter, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure, to, add to everybody who's in here. There was a man, uh, beginning of verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water 
and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Notice if, you cannot, if you're not born of water and of the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's a standard. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, or where it lieth where it cometh from. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but you cannot tell whence it comes, and whither it goeth. So is every man that is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus comes right back with another question. Nicodemus answered and said to him, unto him, how can these things be? When the Word of God, folks, nowadays is being preached and being taught to a lot of people, that's what a lot of people are coming back to Nicodemus. Just like Nicodemus said, how can these things be? They're coming back with the question, how can we live like that in the 21st century? How can we possibly use this standard in the 21st century? How is that possible? We've changed so much. Our culture has changed. Our habits have changed. Our lifestyle has changed. Just like Nicodemus said, many people are saying today, and they don't even realize it. How can these things be? And Jesus is looking down saying, I have never changed. These things are. <clears throat> and we have got to begin to look at, and Jesus goes down and begins to address that question here. Uh, he wasn't just a fan, uh, Nicodemus. But as we look at this man uh, and begin to look at what Christ was beginning to tell him right here, Nicodemus was not just a fan, but he was well known. Nicodemus was a very respected man of God in, in the area. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, who were the religious leaders. He was actually a Pharisee. There was a man of the Pharisees, uh, verse 1 says. He was part of that religious top-notch people uh, who were living at that time. He was an admirer of Jesus for some time. He had obviously listened to the teachings of Jesus, because what does he say? Now, uh, how do you do these miracles except you be with God? So Nicodemus knew about the miracles he was doing. Obviously, Nicodemus has heard what Jesus has had to say uh, in, in the past. So think about what Nicodemus is here. He saw miracles, he's heard the teachings, and yet he comes to Jesus uh, with, this, with, this, uh, with these uh, questions that, that he's got. He's watched Jesus do all of these things. He's, he, he was taken by the compassion. He was taken by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are people walking around today that are taken by the compassion and taken by the, by the love of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. I'm going to get deeper into that in, in just a minute. He wanted to take his relationship to another level. Nicodemus wanted to take this thing to, to a higher level, but he knew this. It was not, not going to be easy. There was going to be way too much to lose. Think about what Nicodemus had to lose here if he begins to follow Jesus Christ. His stature, his level in the society, possibly his rulership uh, in, the, in, the religious, in the religious encounter of that, of that society then. He had a lot to lose if he was actually to come open uh, with Jesus Christ. But being a secret admirer of Jesus was going to cost him everything. But being a follower, being a correction, being a fan of Jesus Christ would not have cost him nothing. Notice when he came, verse 2. He came to Jesus by what? Night. He did not come to Jesus during the day. Why would he not come to Jesus during the day? That's when Jesus was doing the majority of his teaching. That's when he was doing the miracles. He was walking with the people. He was out there doing things. Why didn't Nicodemus come to Jesus during the middle of the day and, said, and, asked, and asked the same question? Afraid of his image. Absolutely. He was afraid of what people were going to say to him. What would the other Pharisees think if he comes to Jesus and begins to ask him questions? He says unto him, notice what he calls him, Rabbi. He didn't, he didn't come to him and say, uh, yo, dude, I need to know why you're doing No, no, no. He recognized Jesus for who he was. He knew that Jesus, uh, he says here that thou, in verse 2, uh, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. He acknowledges the fact that God is obviously with him. Well, this is not good in the Pharisee situation, in the Sanhedrin. This, this is not a good thing to be recognized in Jesus as anything out there. Why? Because they're the religious leaders. We don't need another guy in here. We're, we are the standard. We are the ones that set the standards. We are the rules by which people live by. We are the ones that teach you. We have faced today, my friends, <clears throat> it is growing from 
in, into, the, into the Protestant sector over here where people are taught not to read their Bible. People are taught not to study their Bible. People are actually encouraged not to get too deeply into the Bible because it's too hard to understand. You may not comprehend all that's in there, so I want you to listen to me. I'm the teacher. I'm the one that's going to tell you what the Word of God says. Folks, this is prevalent today. This is going on all around us right now. People are doing this. Why, and, yet, and yet, why are people following stuff like that? When Jesus said, I'm, I'm sending you my Holy Spirit to teach you my Word. I understand the role of the fivefold ministry of the church. I understand why God's got apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. I understand all that. Why he's got he's got people in different offices doing different things. But the ultimate teacher, folks, is the Holy Spirit. The ultimate teacher is, is the Spirit of the living God, and He's with each one of you who truly are saved, and He is the one that's going to help you learn the Word of God. Don't think you can't be taught the Word of God by God Himself. Because he does it every day. And he's willing to come to anybody who wants to hear about him, hear from him. Nicodemus is at a crossroad at this point. He's at a crossroad between religion and relationship. What is he going to do with this man, Jesus? He acknowledges who he is. Of course, Jesus goes down and answers him. Of course, we have the great uh, verse of Scripture, John 3, 16. As he says, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to contemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Notice the world through him might be saved, not through any man. <clears throat> it's simply not going to work. Nicodemus is at a very serious crossroad. As we studied last week, this is his DTR moment. Jesus, he asked the question, Jesus has defined the relationship. Now the question is, what is Nicodemus, what is Nicodemus going to do? And how uh, is he going to address this question right here? He's going to avoid questions from the, from the elect, from the, if you will, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and them. Nicodemus is going to try to, uh, try to avoid them, so he comes to Jesus Christ at night uh, to ask these questions. Fans are happy to follow Jesus as long as there are no significant changes in, in, in their life. I ask people, as I've been beginning to look at this entire study, are you willing to allow Christ to make significant changes in your life? If you're not, my friends, you are a fan. You are not a follower. Because to be a follower of Jesus Christ there's going to be some real, real significant changes made in your life. I think everybody uh, here and then watching the video would, would have to confess they ain't nobody here that can't go through some changes in their life. And I don't care what plateau you're on in spirituality. If you think you're way up here, you can think that if you want to, but you know something, there's another plateau ahead of you. And them plateaus ain't never going to stop until you finally one day get to heaven. They're never going to stop. I find that the people who are the most, uh, for lack of better analogies, the people who are on the highest rungs of the ladder of Christianity, you'll always find are generally the most humble. They're the ones that will admit the fact that they are the ones that need to go so much higher to be, to be more like Jesus. And, and, and some people ask the question, why, why would that be? It seems like the higher you would get, the more you would be like Jesus. Well, yeah, that's just it. The higher you get, the closer you get to Christ, the more you begin to understand His holiness. The more you begin to understand how righteous, uh, the power and the significance of who He is. And therefore, you begin to humble yourself, realizing how low you really are. And that's why, as mature Christians, it's, we have a job to take others under our wings and teach them these things. In a very humble way, we have a job to do that because the, lower, the ones on the lower rungs of the ladder, those who are new Christians or just beginning to learn Christianity, they're still struggling possibly with things of the world. One of the big things is pride. And so they don't see maybe this holiness of God yet. So we need to share these things with them. 
<coughs> we've got to begin to look at it. The closer you get to Christ, the more you're going to realize how low you really are. How was I, I'll ask you the question today that you, can, that you have to answer. How has following Jesus Christ really interfered with your life? One of the measuring sticks you can use, folks, is how has following Christ really interfered with your life? How has following Christ cost you anything? I don't know of a person in the Bible anywhere that we, when we read the examples which are given to us in the Bible where following Christ didn't cost them something. So I ask the question to all of us today, what has following Christ cost you? And if it hasn't cost you anything, then maybe you need to redefine, are you a fan or are you a follower? Because following Christ will change your life. Jesus Christ wants to turn our lives upside down. Fans don't mind a little touch-up work. Jesus is looking for complete renovation. Fans are thinking tune-up. Jesus is thinking overhaul. Let's redefine where we're going and what, and what we're doing with our relationship with Jesus. Nicodemus makes it clear that he's decided Jesus is really from God. Uh, he has come to a point of belief, but now where's he going to go? Uh, Jesus makes it very clear that his righteous acts and his religious rituals are not the measurements. Because you come to church every Sunday, because you read your Bible, because you pray before every dinner, and... Well, I mean, you're really radical, okay? You even pray when you go to restaurants, okay? You're, you're like radical out, out, there, out there with this stuff, okay? You're, you're doing all these things, okay, that are really looking good. But I still ask you the question, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Nicodemus thought he had all that stuff. I promise you, Nicodemus prayed. I promise you, Nicodemus read the Bible. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which means I believe the age is 12 years old. They had memorized the first five books of the Bible, first five books of the Bible. That's how much of the law they knew. He also was brought up in the teachings of, of the Bible. He was brought up in the ways. Did he have knowledge of God in the Old Testament? You betcha. Probably a whole lot more knowledge than some people got today. And yet, he was a fan at this point. He was not a follower. That's all he was, was a fan. So don't think your knowledge of the Bible qualifies you as a follower. But I'm here to tell you today, my friends, it does not. Going to church does not qualify you. Reading your Bible, praying, none of it qualifies you as a follower. Now, will a follower do all those things? Absolutely. Absolutely they'll do those things. But not everybody that does those things is a follower. This whole study, folks, is so good. Because I think it makes us up, wakes us up, and begins to make us ask, ask the question, where really am I? And that's, folks, where we've got to get to. We've lost that concept in our society today. We've lost it. People are afraid to address, uh, to address these questions. Diagnosing fandom. Have you made a decision for Jesus? Or have you committed to Jesus? A lot of people have made a decision. Nicodemus made a decision. He makes it very, very clear in verse 2. You are from God. God, God is with you. He, he, he's, got, he's got a belief here. He's got, he, he's got the belief built into him. He understands what's going on here. But the question is, is he committed to following Jesus Christ? Many people today are making mental, uh, mental decisions about their Christianity. But they're not willing to step out and live the life. They're not willing to step out and make the commitment to follow that which Christ has taught them to do. That's simply too much. They can't deal with that. And so many people are sticking by the, the knowledge, if you will, um, that they had. Being a follower of Christ, folks, calls for movement. I, I read, I always go back to Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore in all the world, and teach them and baptize them. <clears throat> he didn't give us complicated instructions. Number one, he said Go. I yeah, think you've heard me say before, uh, I've, I've said it uh, at different conferences I've been to, I, I'll tell people, I've checked the doors on Sunday morning. I'll watch them. People are not banging the doors down to get in the church. They're sleeping off what they did last night. 
They're not going to come running to your doors. It's just, it doesn't work that way. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world. He did not say, wait for them to come. He said, go into the world and do two things, teach them and get them baptized. The instructions are so simple. The question is, do we believe or are we a follower to the point that we will accept the fact that he gave us the Holy Spirit to give us strength, to give us power, and to give us protection to go and do it? A follower truly is going to require movement. Churches have changed the message to believe from the message to follow. The Gospels say believe five times. The Gospels say follow over 20 times. I want you to understand something, okay? I'm not saying that following is more important than believing because you can't do one without the other. The problem is what I'm saying is they've separated the message to where belief is fine, but we don't hear about following anymore. That's what's being taught right now. I'm not saying that, that, that one is more important than the other. I'm saying that the two are very firmly connected. You've got to have both. In order to be a follower, you've got to have belief. But if you've got belief, you need to take it one step further and become a follower. Most fans are taught belief in Jesus Christ constantly, but they're never taught to follow. Uh, you did take this in your own mind. When was the last time in church services uh, or, or whatever? I'm going to stay there. I'm not going to books because I don't think books have got a lot of answers. I, I believe that there's so many books being written today, there's so much garbage out there that people, that's part of our confusion problem. We got too many books out there trying to teach people this stuff here, and people are getting away from the Word of God. The one book that actually has the answers, we don't seem to read anymore. We're too busy reading the other books, and it's causing nothing but mass confusion amongst the people. If we'd all get back to one book, one way, confusion would leave us because we would understand exactly what Christ taught. That was the beauty of what the, what the apostles had that we don't have anymore. The apostles had one book, one way. They had one church. They had the church of Ephesus, the church of Philippi, the church of Corinth. They didn't have all the stuff we've got today. Because I'm going to tell you something, folks, this may sound really weird to you. We have too much information. We really do. We've, we've got, I, I always tell folks that when I, when I hear about this thing about, <clears throat> this is a bit of a rabbit, but I need to go there. We got too many people who are out there explaining the Bible. Well, this is what it really means. Well, I, I understand you're reading this, but let me explain exactly what that means. And they go off of their tangent, and, the, and you're, I'm sitting there scratching my head, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, John said it meant this. And man, look at the size of his church. And you're saying it means this. Um, which way am I going to go? Well, your sounds a little better. Well, I'm on this side of the pencil over here. And we've got people that are differing in what they say. And what happens is it's causing mass confusion. Now, I got a question. <clears throat> Who do you think has the better teaching? Do you think after 2012 years after the cross, that we are smarter about what was written in the Bible than what Peter, James, and John were? I believe with all my heart they had the truth. They wrote the Bible. They had a lot more intuitive knowledge about what was going on than we have today. We can't be smarter than they were. We can't be. It's impossible. What we have, have you ever played the game in the circle? Uh, you tell one person one thing, and they whisper it in the ear of the next, and they whisper it in the ear of the next, and you get all the way around the circle, and the last person announces what was said. And it's always some twisted version of, of, what, of what the first person says. It's kind of a fun game to play. But that's what's happened. Let me tell you, that's exactly what's happened with the Bible. What's happened is they started with the truth. We call it the Holy Word of God. Okay, they started with the truth. The next generation got a hold of that, and started explaining it. 
The next generation got a hold of it, and they did it. And everybody's been whispering in their years for over 2,000 years. And today, folks, in many cases, what we have is a distorted picture of what the Bible really means. And that's why I'm firm to say the closer you get to the cross, what I mean, is, what I mean by that is the closer you get to the day that Jesus died and the teachings of the apostles, the more clearly you're going to understand what God really meant. And if we today, in the church today, and in the Christian philosophy, if we have something that doesn't seem to agree with what they taught, this needs to change because you're not going to change them. I am the Lord thy God, and I change not. God will not change for you. He will not do it. He cannot do it, because if he did it, he's a liar. And if he's a liar, he's not God. God cannot change for you. Never forget that. I know it's a bit of a rabbit, but it's so, it, it, it's so important to understand. We've got to get back to what this word, if it says it, believe it, and do it. And if that's uncomfortable, if you've been taught something, if people have, I, I've watched people, I've watched them walk into ministers' offices, and I'm gonna, this is a personal, a personal story that I can tell you that I know for a fact it's happening. They walk into a minister's office, that minister lowers their standard. They, they feel comfortable about it. Why? Because the pastor said it's okay. Obviously, that's going to make them feel better. They go and they begin to live that, and years down the road, they pay a dire penalty for what they did. I've watched it happen because people are lowering the standards of what the Bible says we are supposed to be doing. And we are at a point in our time, folks, where I believe faith-wise, we are paying a dear, dear penalty for what God wants us to be. Are we a fan or are we a follower? What it's known as today is selling Jesus. Uh, some may not like that term, so let me explain to you what I mean. Many people are trying to sell Jesus. Churches are reluctant to shine a bright light on commitment in fear that it might hurt their sales numbers. Understand what I'm saying? They're afraid to shine light on what commitment really means for fear that it's going to hurt their sales numbers. But Jesus didn't hold back with Nicodemus. Jesus, Jesus told him, verily, verily, Jesus doesn't wait to address Nicodemus' question. He goes right to the core. He didn't, he didn't fool around. He says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, if you ain't born again, you're not going to heaven. I don't care who you are. You're not going to make, you're not going to make it, brother. Think about, think about this. Moses, he couldn't follow God without going before Pharaoh. I'm going to tell you right now, that was a tough thing. Moses had a rough job, but he couldn't follow God unless he went before Pharaoh. Noah couldn't go before God, couldn't be a follower unless he built a boat in the middle of the desert, never seen rain, there ain't no water anywhere, the ridicule and the mockery was amazing for over 100 years. Noah had to build a boat. Daniel, he couldn't be a follower unless he prayed to God and stayed praying to God, which cost him the lion's den. There's things that it's going to cost people as we go along. It's a 24-hour commitment. It's going to interfere with your life. And my friends, I promise you that's a guarantee. And I believe the closer we get to the rapture, the closer we get to the end times, the more it's going to begin to cost people. And I see those days coming very, very quickly. I am watching changes in our great nation. What at one time was the greatest in all the world. I think it still is. I think it's still a great nation. I think it's some great people. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. I'm watching the changes in this country that are really pointing to the end times. Really pointing to where Christianity is beginning to be removed and in some cases being made illegal. I don't know whether you're aware of it or not, but there's people in our country today that are being thrown in jail for the teaching of the gospel. There was a time when you could stand on a street corner and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in our country and nobody would blink an eye. Today, there's people being thrown in jail for it. 
Things are happening all around you. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the infomercials you hear at night. You all seen infomercials at night? They ain't nothing you can't buy. I don't get 1995, and now everybody is buy one, get one free. Think, think about the infomercials we have at late at night. All the glamour, all the money, the life of freedom uh, that, that, you, that you could have, and guess what? It'll cost you nothing. In fact, we're even going to take care of the shipping and handling. We want you to get this free for 30 days. We just want you to have it in your home. We want you to get a piece of what we've got. People are looking at that and saying, man, life of freedom, this thing does everything in the world. I mean, it operates my kitchen by itself, it seems like. Uh, everything in the world is easier. How can anybody say no? <coughs> How can anybody say no to that? Obviously, 1-800, send me two. You know, that, that everybody is going along, along these ways here. Think about what's going on in the church. Think about what's being said inside the church. Many pre preachers today have missed their calling. They should have been infomercial salesmen. Because think about what they're saying. Okay? Listen, folks. Salvation. Your sins can be forgiven. Heaven someday. It's, it's for you. And man, oh, by the way, give one, get ten. You, know, you, you put a dollar in our pot, God's going to give you ten. Put a hundred in there, you get a thousand. You put a thousand, God gives you ten thousand. Think, uh, people are sitting in the pew saying, how can I say no? How can I say no to such a wonderful package deal? And they leave it right there. People come forward, they, they, they pray a prayer, they walk away saying, I got it, I got it. And it didn't cost me a thing. And nobody anymore is teaching people that it's going to cost you everything. They leave it right there, and they never, ever take these people under their wings. And they never begin to teach you. They signed up for a gospel that cost them nothing, and they offered them everything. I want to share this with you. There's no forgiveness without repentance. There's no, celebra there's no celebration uh, uh, without being, without being uh, surrendered. There's no life without death. There's no believing without committing. There's nothing you can have in the, in the Christian realm without it costing you something out there. Some sermons and teachings may, may make you feel like they're talking directly to you. I want you to hear me one time, folks, and I'm getting ready to close. Because you hear a teaching or you hear a sermon that you feel is talking directly to you does not give you the right to leave what you're doing. It means you need to evaluate who you are. And many people today, if they don't hear what they want to hear, they run down the road to this one down here. Back in the days when I lived in the world, we used to call them bar hoppers. Now we have church hoppers. And they're looking for something that just simply fits them. And it's not too uncomfortable with what they're doing. I'm going to pray God's blessings on you. We're going to go on a little bit more. I want to say a couple more things about, uh, about uh, Nicodemus. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm not, let, me, let me go ahead. I, I got two more minutes. I, I, can wrap, I can wrap this up. Because Nicodemus, in this case here, did not go on. Nicodemus did not actually become a follower at this point. We only see Nicodemus two more times in the Bible. We see Nicodemus in chapter 7, uh, where Jesus' popularity has grown immensely. Uh, the religious leaders, they're overcome with jealousy. They're overcome with fear. Uh, the Sanhedrin meet at a, at a place in John, in John chapter 7 uh, where they're finding a reason to silence the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to drum up accusations and charges that would indict Jesus Christ. Uh, Nicodemus is sitting amongst all of his peers. There's going to be about 72 of them there in the Sanhedrin. There's going to be 72 men. Nicodemus is there with them. Nicodemus has not decided to follow Christ yet. Even after the, the, the encounter in chapter 3, Nicodemus has not decided to follow yet. He, he, he said his, uh, the question is, would his belief turn into, into, into commitment or what he's going to do? John chapter 7, verses 51 and 52 make, make, an amazing, make an amazing statement. Maybe, let me just read these for you real quick. He says, Doth our law judge, uh, Nicodemus finally stands up. He says, Doth our, ju our law judge any man uh, before it hear him and know what he doeth? He asked him the question about the law. But he never says, Look at guys, this man's of God. 
This man is truly the Christ. Nicodemus takes it a step further because now he stands up against his peers. But he doesn't necessarily acknowledge God. He doesn't take it to the final step where he acknowledges Jesus for who he is. But he raises the question, and so what do these people say? Yo, Nicodemus, are you also of Galilee? Search and look, for the Galilee ariseth, out of Galilee arises no prophet. What they do is they turn around because of the question Nicodemus asks, they, they try to associate Nicodemus with Christ. Remember they said nothing good comes out of Galilee. You know, they say here, out of Galilee arises no prophet. By the way, Nicodemus, are you one of the him? Are you part of him? Nicodemus now comes to another crossroad in his relationship. And then we see Nicodemus one more time in John chapter 19. Jesus has been crucified, his body has been prepared for burial, and Nicodemus shows up <coughs> with 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes to anoint his body. He now publicly goes forward for who the Christ really is. Uh, we don't know what Nicodemus did after that. We see John chapter 3, 7, and 19. We don't know what he did except for church history tells us that Nicodemus also died a martyr for Jesus Christ. You know, and here's the question we've got to begin to, begin to ask, folks. Are you, really, are you hiding your faith? Are you ready for radical changes in your life? Or are you even willing to allow Christ to make those radical changes in your life? Do you measure Jesus by the standards of the world, by our culture? Or do you measure him by the Bible and by Christ himself? Is the Bible your ruler? Or is that too hard? Don't wait like Nicodemus did. I'm going to close with this thought to send you home to think about. Don't wait like Nicodemus did. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. Time is running out. We may not have, however long this period would have been, three years, two years, we may not have that much time left anymore. I'm not saying we don't, but I'm saying we may not. Time is running out. Let's not wait like Nicodemus did. Let's begin to evaluate our faith. And let's find out, ask yourself, am I a fan or am I a follower? And use the measurement tools that we've talked about today. Again, you can watch this video on uh, biblicaltruthtoday.com and uh, be able to hear everything I said one more time. Uh, even say it the same way. But we've got to begin to evaluate ourselves, folks, and think and think about what Christ wants to do in our life.